You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. I got a card in the mail last month from my local cops. And it wasn't a late holiday greeting. It was a request that I tell the mayor and tell my local councillor that they need money. More money than they're already getting. The police were upset, you see, about Toronto Mayor Olivia Chow's decision not to give them all the money they asked for. Not her decision to give them no money, not a plan to defund the police, but simply to increase their $1.2 billion budget by about $7 million instead of $20 million. And the mayor herself pointed this out. Let me set the record straight. The Toronto police are receiving millions dollar more on the budget. There's no cuts. This process is not uncommon. Across the country, budgets are floated, police ask for more money, and if they don't get everything they want, they lobby for it. Sometimes, like with my card, very publicly. And listen, it would be no different than the local transit authority or municipal waste management department doing the same thing. Except, the specter here is the safety of my neighborhood. The card told me that police needed more money because they were getting more calls and it was taking them longer to respond to those calls. Surely, the subtext here implies, if I ever needed the police, I didn't want that to happen to me. Anyway, the cards and the lobbying worked. In yesterday's Toronto budget, the police got their extra money after all. And in cities across Canada, police budgets are generally increasing by millions of dollars every single year. Now, is that money necessary for our safety? Are we really seeing more crime that needs police response? Do we not have enough officers to police our cities? And uh, just because everyone's yelling about it, are car thefts really going through the roof? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Ted Rutland is an associate professor at Concordia University. His research involves, among other things, policing in Canada. Hi, Ted. Hello. Can we start with uh, the fight over Toronto's police budget? I know um, it's just one city, but it's been a pretty big fight, and I, I think kind of emblematic at where we are on funding the police these days. I think that's true, yeah. What's going on? Well, uh, as you know, and as many of your listeners probably know, Toronto is in a budget-making process. There was a budget increase recommended for the Toronto police. There was going to be a $20 million increase for 2024, which would bring the total budget of the Toronto police to $1.2 billion. And uh, Mayor Olivia Chow suggested a smaller budget increase, so a $7.4 million increase instead. Mm -hmm. And then there's been a whole debate since that, uh, since then, with the Toronto Police Chief, Myron Demkew, calling this a budget cut, which it is not, saying that their services and therefore the safety of Torontonians would be impaired if they didn't get their full uh, budget increase. And, and then there's been some very intelligent arguments, both supporting Olivia Chow or saying that even that $7.4 million is too large an increase. And I believe um, as we're speaking today on Valentine's Day, Olivia Chow is presenting her budget. And in the end, the mayor appears to have backed down. That is what it seems. Yes. Happy Valentine's Day to everyone. This is why I wanted to start here, because I want to get into this is the time of year when most municipalities are in their budgeting process. And uh, as we'll talk about, uh, police budgets are the vast majority of that. Um, Olivia Chow is Toronto's most progressive mayor in ages. And if Olivia Chow would quickly back down on, to your point, what was not exactly even a budget cut, just not as big a budget increase as the police would like, it kind of seems as if then anyone would and this discussion is over. 
Yeah, well, I don't think it's over, but it, it is telling, right, that that she is, you know, one of the most progressive mayors Toronto's had and certainly one of the most progressive that we've seen uh, in a Canadian city in a while, much more progressive than than anyone else who's currently a mayor of a large city in Canada. So what does that tell us? I think one thing it tells us is that the forces um, organizing for continually continual expansions in police resources, police funding, and police powers are very strong. So you have, you know, the Toronto Police Association, which I refuse to call a union, but it is an association of of police officers that negotiates their contracts, etc. And these are it's a powerful lobbying body. There's an equivalent in every large Canadian city, sometimes called a police association or a brotherhood, and they organize the rank and file police. And so they can organize a kind of revolt among police officers. And their power to do that, you know, essentially gives them more power than the police chief, or sometimes more powerful than the mayor. They also have close relationships with the media. So the media mostly parrots the position of the police and the police association. You know, Toronto is lucky to have a couple of media outlets that covers things more critically. We don't have that benefit in Montreal. And then you have, you know, politicians of the right um, that can, have been campaigning on sort of tough on crime agendas for 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 four decades now. Mm-hmm. And the the left, such as it is, has generally been afraid to articulate a different agenda. And so the agenda becomes the debate becomes a, a debate between tough on crime or less tough on crime, which 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 people hear as less safe. What I would like to see the left do is to really take its lead from the Black Lives Matter movement and to fund the police movement, which has, you know, been very wise, intelligent, and visionary in terms of crafting alternative way of thinking about safety with the research to to back them up and to say, we're not talking about more or less safety. We're talking about more, we're talking about a different way to provide safety that involves a smaller role for police and is actually far better at, at, at dealing with um, the more serious forms of, of insecurity, unsafety, and violence that we face in our communities. And I haven't seen Olivia Chow make that argument, really. It, it, she's more or less sort of framed it in terms of we're in a budgetary difficulty, everyone needs to play their part, and so we're going to give the police a budget increase, but not that big a one. And so it really makes it seem like the debate is between more money for the police or a little bit <laughs> more money and then less safety. And that's no way to frame the debate. You're going to lose that one. Right. Would it surprise you to know that here in Toronto, uh, I received a postcard in the mail from the Toronto Police Association? It would not surprise me because Torontonians have been sending me photos of the cards that they've been receiving. But that is out of control. Can you imagine? It was basically, as I recall, like a mailer, the kind you would get from your local uh, city councillor saying, you know, the requests for our services. And here I'm going to make, because I would actually like you to address this, the case that the police are making. The requests for our services have increased by uh, a huge amount, and we are finding it difficult to respond to them in an effective manner, which is why we need more money please tell your counselor, tell your mayor that we need this to make you safe. That's the, that's the gist of the argument. And like I said, it's like, it's like we were in a campaign and I was getting it from a politician. Yeah. Or like you just received a visit from a protection racket, which is the way that Andrea Ritchie, a really important black abolitionist organizer and intellectual in the United States, but said, it's like, we're giving you $1.2 billion and you're telling us that's not enough to keep you safe. You need more money. Sort of like, you know, Nice place. Be ashamed if something happened to it. But to engage with that argument, there's a couple of leaps they're making. First is they're saying that there are increased demands on their time and their resources. Um, That appears to be true. But then they're saying, you know, we need more money to respond to it, which is not necessarily true. And they're saying, if we have this extra money, you'll be safer. Or if we don't get this money, you won't be safe. And so I would focus on this. So it's two middle leaps. One is that They're saying that the police must have more resources to respond to these calls. And I think we we know pretty well now that a lot of what the police do and are called on to do has nothing to do with crime, has nothing to do with the specific training they have, which is to, you know, enforce the law. 
Yeah, you and I spoke about this last year, right? About the alternative means of of diverting a lot of those uh, calls to police, to counselors, to mental health professionals, to all sorts of people. Yeah, yeah. And Toronto has been a, you know, nobody is really a leader on this, but Toronto is doing better on this than any other city. And so this would be a really great time to be like, okay, you have increased calls for service. Let's actually look at those and let's see whether we can divert some of those calls elsewhere till you lighten your load. And then secondly, obviously, they're really making a big leap between calls for service and your safety. Hmm. Because again, most calls have nothing really to do with safety. You know, most of what the police are called to respond to are not criminal matters and they're not matters of safety. So that's a huge leap to make. Most of what the police do has nothing to do with crime, has nothing to do with violence. Give people some examples of typical calls that the police respond to that aren't about enforcing the law and preserving public safety, just so people can picture it. Sure. Well, I mean, you, they, they respond to noise complaints, for example, which basically means that, like people are unwilling to walk next door and say, can you turn down your stereo? They're responding to quarrels between neighbors. People will call the police if there's an unhoused person hanging out in front of their house and they don't want that person to be there rather than actually go talk to that person and see if it's possible for them to move two feet. They call the police if they see an unhoused person sort of sleeping or drinking. They call the police if they see like a group of black youth on the corner. They're responding to all kinds of things that have nothing to do with, you know, actual infractions to the law. I want to ask a little bit more about the correlation between funding and safety in particular. Do we have any data on whether or not as cities increase their police budget, uh, crime rates go down, which is essentially like the very core of the police argument, right? It is. And, you know, in this debate in Toronto, um, there was a helpful report that was provided that showed that there is no correlation between police funding um, and crime rates. And we've known that for a long time. I mean, research in the early 70s began to show that, um, that you could increase the police budget, decrease the police budget. It had no direct effect on crime rates. And, you know, we sort of know this without looking at the research. You know, crime is a complicated thing. It it increases and decreases for, for a variety of reasons. I mean, we saw an increase in certain kinds of violence in 2020 because of the social disruptions of the pandemic. And you could have had a police force double the size in 2020, and you'd still have that increase because, you know, all of the normal things in the society that, that keep violence in check were disrupted. All the things that can prevent violence were disrupted. And we, people were dealing with new kinds of problems, um, mental health problems, uh, et, et cetera. So we kind of know this. The way that the, the Toronto police chief has tried to duck this is kind of interesting. He's continually confronted by journalists who are like, hey, we have this study that shows that there's no correlation between police budget and and criminality. Uh, And he says, I've seen it um, in my own work. There is definitely a correlation between police presence and feelings of safety. It's like, oh, you just changed the debate there. Yeah, feelings. Now we're talking about feelings? Yeah. Well, do we really want, you know an institution as potentially violent and dangerous as the police to be deployed in order to reduce feelings of unsafety. I think we should, you know, talk about that a little bit. And then secondly, obviously, we should know this as well, is that the police, a police presence does make some people feel more safe. And it also makes some people feel less safe, particularly people who come from communities who are targeted by police. And so, like, I don't expect a lot from a police chief you know, but if you're going to be a political actor, if you're going to weigh in on a political debate in a big city, big and diverse city like Toronto, you better be willing to admit that when you say that the police make people feel safe, that you're talking about a particular subsection of the population, because lots of people do not they feel less safe when the police are around for very good reasons. So far, we've talked about Toronto, but is this discussion uh, that we are having applicable more broadly? As I mentioned, this is the time of year when all municipalities are dealing with budgets and police are a huge part of that. Is this unique in Toronto, both in terms of the request for more money, the reasons for it, and the defense of that? No, the police want more money every year. 
And they find new ways to justify that every year. And so since 2020, since since the police budgets became a little bit more politicized than they have been in the past, because organizers, activists, Black communities, Indigenous communities were able to show how police budgets were, were related to the unsafety and violence that they experienced. We've seen different police forces make different arguments for why they need more money. In the West of Canada, it's been a lot about unhoused people, mental illness, uh, drug use, which they all kind of try to throw into the same basket and say that it's a, a growing problem and a growing threat to our community. In Toronto, it's mostly been around transit violence on the subway. In Montreal, it's been mostly about gun violence, uh, except they've had to change the tune lately. And so, you know, Montreal has already passed its budget for 2024, and they passed another police budget increase. Uh, Montreal has increased the police budget more in the last three years than at any time in history, and then more than anywhere in Canada. And the police have managed to get that budget increase by hyping up fears of gun crime, which they attribute to street gangs. And when you say street gangs in Montreal or Toronto, you're invoking the image of a young Black person, even though there are street gangs in all kinds of communities. It's just that that, that, that word has been ideologically tied to Black youth for quite a long time. And they managed to, you know, get huge budget increases on the basis of that. Gun crime has d- went down in 2023 in Montreal, as it did across North America, because we were re- recovering from some of the social disruptions of the pandemic. Uh, but now they're hyping car theft, which you might have heard a- about a little bit as well, because this is becoming a nationwide panic. And the police are working really hard to show why we all need to care uh, deeply about car theft how it's increasing uh, to an unprecedented extent, which of course is not true, and how more police and more police resources will be the solution to that. So basically what we see is just like the police will lobby for more money based on some kind of phenomenon that they can argue is increasing and it's increasing because we don't have enough police resources and if we don't provide those resources, everyone will be less safe. I want to ask you two things about car theft, because you're right, I think a lot of listeners have a heard about it um, in the media and, and from our politicians, and probably, first of all, wonder uh, why you just said that's not true. So maybe explain that. And then second of all, my my personal question about the police and car theft is the cops don't actually stop car theft, right? Like they get, get stolen from your driveway and then you call the cops when it's gone. That's right. That's right. So I guess the first thing I would say about the phenomenon of car theft is all the police lobby groups and the sort of tough on crime people like Pierre Poliev are saying, you know, there's been a huge spike in car theft since 2020 or since 2021 or since 2019. Whenever someone gives you this sort of time frame, we need to ask a question like, why are they choosing to start the clock there? What would happen if we started the clock somewhere else? And I've looked at the data, which are, you know, publicly available, and car theft hit a historic low in 2019 and 2020. So you're comparing the level of car theft now to an unprecedentedly low level in 2019 or 2020. So that's like a very ideological way of spinning the data. And it has increased since 2020, you know, quite, quite substantially. But we're still around the average of the last 20 years. So that's one thing. Let's let's get things in perspective. And then secondly, you know, what do police officers do in terms of, you know, stopping car theft? Of course, they don't prevent it. Uh, As as your case mentioned, they can sometimes investigate and track the person down. The police normally don't put a lot of resources into this um, because it's not a priority issue. Because if you get your car stolen and you have insurance, you know, it's not nice, but you get your, you get a new car, you know, quite different than like a murder for example. So it's it's treated as a low priority issue. Like most people who get their car stolen, um, they're not going to get it back, but they're going to get the insurance money. So it's not nothing, right? But it's it's not a, a real safety issue. It's just like a not nice thing for people who are having their cars stolen. And then, you know, the thing that, that does make a big difference, of course, we can ask, like, why did car thefts hit a historic low in 2019 or 2020? really descending rapidly from around 2000 or 2002. It's mostly about technology. You know, the car companies got ahead of organized crime by making different kinds of keys 
making it harder to hotwire cars, all this kind of stuff. And right now, the organized crime has gotten ahead of the technology. That's not the only reason it's increasing, but it's, but it's one of the things. And the most interesting people to listen to in terms of how to reduce um, car theft are, of course, the insurance companies. Because the insurance companies aren't trying to get elected on a tough on crime campaign. They're not trying to get more resources for the police. They want their expenses to go down. So they want the most effective solutions possible to car theft so that so they don't have to keep paying out these 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 uh, damages. And you know, they've been saying that, you know, there's a, a particular kind of tracking device that you can put in a car, costs about hundred or two hundred dollars. And and they're saying that, you know, people who have this, we recover the car hundred percent of the time. So I don't know if it's that technology, that specific technology that is the solution. But that or another technological solution are far more effective than just, you know, having more police. Because as you say, like, you could, you could hire 200 more cops in a city. I'm a not, not really clear what that's going to do. You might track down a few more of the cars that have been stolen, but you're definitely not going to stop, stop the car thefts from happening. One of the arguments that I have heard, and I think a lot of people can probably identify with, is that inflation has made everything more expensive, especially operating costs for businesses and uh, services. Is that a valid explanation for an increase in police budgets that, you know, we got to pay more for the gas that goes in the cars? Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, obviously, just to maintain the same, same level of police services, you would have to increase the budget every year. And, you know, the the original budget increase that Olivia Chow was was presenting probably didn't keep pace with inflation. So the the argument that we make for, you know, freezing police budgets or decreasing them can't be that, you know, that this money be, would be wasted. The money would go to maintain the existing services. The debate has to be the larger one that, that we want to move on to next, to thinking about, you know, how do we want to use public money when it comes to providing safety? And might we be able to provide more safety by shifting some of the money we currently give to the police to other things. And, you know, Toronto, again, has, and Edmonton as well, I think in the last few years, have uh, routinely framed these budget debates in terms of, we're going to come do something close to freezing the police budget, but we're going to increase funding for a civilian response team, which will lower the workload on police. And, and, and that's like far a far better move um, and a better way of framing the issue than, than trying to say that the police don't need more money because, you know, again, their costs are going up for sure. So we need, if we want to reduce their budget, we need to give them less work. Is the argument for defunding the police a losing one when put that way? And I say that because it is what we've heard about Olivia Chow uh, since she began her campaign. The police chief, a former police chief, Mark Saunders, said that Olivia Chow wants to defund the police. She'd be a disaster. He was running against her. As she pitched this modest increase instead of the bigger one, she was accused of defunding the police. And to your point, like... Is it a better sell to try to come up with a way, and I know it's not as catchy, to say, like, fund the police, but divert some of that money into non-policing programs that can tackle things that would otherwise be left to the police? Like, how do we how do we move towards selling it that way uh, so that it doesn't sound to the average person like we're saying, yeah, make us less safe? Yeah, I think there's been some really interesting debates and research on this in the last few years. And, and where I, I've arrived at is that I think defund the police, reinvest in community is the right slogan for organizers. Because it's, it's, very, it's a powerful demand um, that gets at the incredible level of violence and unsafety that the police are imposing on some communities. And it's also a demand where we can see whether they actually did it or not. Like the police, they can't say that we defunded the police if they didn't. We can look objectively at their budget and see whether they were defunded or not. I think that for politicians, it might be better to use a different way of framing it. And so, you know, investing in real safety or a broad approach to safety or addressing the root causes of harm, um, which is really what the activists are saying too. But, you know, it gets at the, the, that we're really committed to safety and providing the safety the best way possible in a way that, you know, I guess doesn't seem like you're just talking about taking money away from the police. We might want to 
frame the issue differently, whether we're an organizer or whether we're a politician. Chad, thank you so much for this. It's always a pleasure. And uh, I guess we'll see what kind of movement we make on this maybe next year at this time. I hope so. I hope so. Thanks for, for following the issue and thanks for having me on. Ted Rutland of Concordia University. That was The Big Story. For more, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can, of course, write an email to us. That address is hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can call us and leave us a voicemail, 416-935-5935. And you can rate and review this show in whatever podcast player lets you do it. Not all of them, but some of them, especially Apple and Spotify will. So click five stars and we will be most grateful. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.